Hey there, Knicks fans. How's it going? Welcome, welcome. Happy Tuesday. Um, and welcome to another episode of Cap Rules Everything Around Me. Cream, get the money. Dollar dollar bills, y'all. Um, excited to do this. A lot we can probably talk about today. We are in nine days, nine days away from the draft. Exciting. I'm at the point where I'm kind of agnostic about what the Knicks do, mostly because I just, I'm not super worried. I feel like the last couple of years they've shown they can find good choices, make good choices, and find good players on the board. So it's not something I'm losing a whole lot of sleep over, but I, I'm sure other people are racked with nerves and uh, I can't say I blame you at the same time. Um, it'll be exciting. Hopefully things start to pick up soon and that would be great because I'm really excited for actual basketball involving the Knicks outside of aspirations and what we kind of think they might do or think about what they won't do, whatever that might be. So I thought today was kind of interesting. Um, seems that Tuesdays are usually the days that Jake Fisher drops an article. I thought that his article today was a good glimpse into something because we didn't get a whole lot going on. Um, some good stuff in here, as always, from Jake. Feels like the Hawks are just kind of they've got their hands in a lot of different places trying to see what sticks when they throw things at the wall. I thought that the mentioning of a couple pacers was noteworthy. Um, what I was thinking about is how it feels like when there's something super relevant or rather that, that Fisher feels confident with, he's very exact with his reporting. Like before when he was talking about Jalen Brunson, as opposed to what Woj said, which was no cap space, Fisher said something about like how there'd have to be cap maneuvering or, um, or he used some sort of buzzword at the time, uh, salary moving. It, it wasn't quite as extreme. It kind of kept the door open for the opportunity of a sign and trade. And um, uh, Schwinn sent me last year, there's a screenshot of what Fisher had written the day before free agency. It was how um, I mean, he, he hit pretty much every nail right on the head. Uh, Fournier deal around $18 million annually. Uh, Burks, three years, $30 million. Noel, um, $10 million a year. It, like it was, it was exact. Um, but then it's interesting how he kind of just uh, juxtaposes that with saying about, you know, like the Knicks have been linked to Brogdon in recent days by league personnel. I don't doubt it. I don't think that the Knicks have zero, uh, you know, uh, have, have no interest whatsoever in Malcolm Brock. I'm sure there is interest, and it, it certainly sounds like he would be a backup plan to the other options. Uh, it's nice to know, of course, that trading up from the number 11 pick and Brogdon in the same sentence don't really go together. It seems, hey, let's look at Brogdon as opposed to, hey, let's use the 11th pick to get Malcolm Brogdon. So um, that would be a very uh, nice, relaxing thing that were the case. Um, but then of course he talks about Jalen Brunson, but it seems like Brunson is going to be more of a forethought as is uh, Jaden Ivy. Um, so, you know, if anything, if there's going to be some sort of Brogdon deal, I think you have to probably ship out Evan Fournay as the matching salary. And I'm at the point now where at the beginning of the off season, John and I didn't think Fournay was really going to go anywhere. And I've kind of done, a 180 on it just based on the fact that if the Knicks are going to go with a guard or a wing, you know, they're still going to want Quentin Grimes, assuming he's here to play. They're still going to want Emmanuel quickly, assuming he's here to play. I could easily see this year's pick. If it's not Jaden Ivy being on the outside, looking in for the rotation, because that's what happened with Quentin Grimes, but there still could be the option of, okay, well we can also keep cam. Maybe we prefer Alec Burks in the backup spot if you want to elevate Quentin Grimes, although I'm not sure if he's ready to be a starter. You know, maybe year three, that's when he would be starting type. But even still, I think Fournier is kind of the odd man out for his own sake. The question I have is, if you're not moving, if you're not acquiring Brogdon, and let's say the Knicks do get Brunson, and we know that Fournier doesn't really work in a sign-and-trade, what are you doing to maneuver 
that way. Um, and honestly, one potential thought that I had is the and the math works. It's like if the Knicks didn't want to proceed with Mitchell Robinson and they wanted to do a sign and trade, put him aside, you could always do something like Fournier for uh, Rashawn Holmes and Mo Harkless without even including the fourth or 11th pick, you know, something that maybe brings in a position of need. Um, the Kings certainly could use spacing. They, they just don't really seem to have a lot of shooters on the roster and they have a lot of fives. The Knicks, maybe they don't want to pay Mitchell Robinson. It's not about not wanting to pay a center. It might just be not wanting to pay Mitchell Robinson. Um, so that could certainly be an option, but it's just, it's amazing how one key piece can then affect so many other things. Uh, and maybe, I mean, maybe, as I said with uh, John and Andrew, maybe there's a world in which the Knicks do want Jalen Brunson and want Jaden Ivey. And they just to say, hey, we can let's get as much talent, as much ball handling here as we can. Um, a lot of attacking the rim. Focus on that and move forward. So it'll be interesting to see how they do it. But then one piece turning into other pieces and how that spirals. I'm fascinated by it. Again, really eager for this week to kind of go as quickly as possible and then next week and then the week after that but at least we'll get some sort of uh something to sink our teeth into with the draft and we can cross that off the list and reevaluate from there uh so without further ado i think get to some questions uh the first is from mino f player on the knicks who would it be example grimes three-point shooting obi's athleticism cam's length fluidity i would say Mitchell Robinson's hands at the rim. Because for me, I think that the pieces can come together for RJ. It's just a matter of if you fix the finishing, the effective field goal percentage goes way up. And if the effective field goal percentage goes up, then he's not looked at as this inefficient turd of a basketball player, um, which is crazy to me, but I digress. So by doing that, it's nice. You get the easy points, you finish that's that's important for his growth um i'd say you could then argue maybe the pull-up shooting like grimes has good pull-up shooting we just haven't seen a whole lot of it um quickly he's a good pull-up threat that's another option so but i think i'd stick with the with mitch's hands definitely not noel's hands at least not on the offensive end defensive end i mean yeah he's a one-way one-way hand guy in that sense i don't know so that's where i'll go with Zach Smith. Hey, Jeremy, I can't recall if you said this at the beginning of this week's episode. Based on uh, based on Berman's thoughts on draft class, do you see Randall getting traded? If so, where? I still do. I Listen, I know that Knicks fans are kind of resigned to the idea, at least some of them, that Randall's going to be here because why would anyone move him? And he's got to find a place to go. I get it. I hear that completely. Benji retweeted an old thread that he did, which showed... Julius doing good Julius things. And I just, I know that that is not the norm. It's more of the exception, at least based on how it went last year. I just feel like there's enough good there that some team will say, yeah, we're willing to at least improve and get better and do that. The question of course is who will it be? The fascinating thing is there are probably other teams that have to deal with, Um, their own in-house or other potential options like the Blazers. um, If they like John Collins more than like they like Julius Randall, I get that. I understand the logic, but if they don't have a trade that works out, Julius Randall's available. Um, I think the other thing to kind of consider is that Julius might not get moved on draft night and that's okay because there's just a lot of configurations. In fact, if I had to make a guess, I think it's much more likely that Julius is traded when free agency has begun as opposed to the draft, just because you have to worry about matching salary. And, you know, there are going to be some teams that lose out on various things. They want like Deandre Ayton. If the Blazers are interested in Deandre Ayton, that's great. But if Deandre Ayton is taking meetings and uh, whatnot, and the Blazers still feel they have a chance, they're not going to make a move for Julius Randall on draft night because they're going to be looking for the cap space or they're going to be looking for a sign and trade opportunity, which I guess would be Simon's, but it's hard to sign and trade that. So I just think that Julius is probably going to be more in demand. Like the second day of free agency. 
but I'd love for him to, if he is moved, to have it be done on uh, draft night. I think that would be great. I just don't know if, I, I just think it gets too complicated in terms of, you know, like, yes, it makes sense to us why if you're the Blazers, moving Bledsoe and seven for Randall and 11 would be a home run. Just based on the fact you're turning someone who's not really an NBA player and you're moving down four spots to get someone who is an NBA player and a starter. Just a matter of the movement from there. So as opposed to where it's just so tricky because I think it I think it probably has to be it's either a three team deal or another team traded for someone. And then there's a massive opening at the four. And then they say, yeah, Randall's better than what we've got. We'll do that. I don't think he'll be super highly valued, but if the Knicks feel the need to move him and prioritize Obi, I think they'll do it. I just, I think it, again, at worst, I think he's neutral. I'm not looking for a whole lot. I'm looking for a little bit more ideally than moving up four spots and taking on blood. So, but I'd be more comfortable with it if it was then as a springboard to move up to four, but I digress. That's a conversation for another day. Uh, from Drew P. Thank you for the super chat contribution, Drew. What do you think RJ playing for Canada will tell us? I think it'll tell us a lot about his relationship with Shea Gilgis Alexander. Um, jokes aside, you know, Canada's produced some really great, really good talent. I mean, look no further than what Andrew Wiggins has done in this in these finals. So hopefully the development staff is certainly good for Canada. But the nice thing about playing with the nice thing about Canada being a better team um, and fielding better players is that the better players then get to scrimmage with better players. So RJ's not, you know, like Jokic, for example, with all due respect to Serbia, their national team is him. Like he doesn't get to scrimmage when they're playing uh, and, and qualifying for events against legitimate NBA talent. There's some very good international talent. I'm sure playing in leagues, but it's not nearly where, you know, the Canadian team might have in terms of players. So um, yeah, I hope it just makes them better. Keep scrimmaging against good talent and go from there. Uh, Luna Samarat got to hear potential trades to move up to four from Andrew and Macri. What's the most you'd personally give up to move up to four for Ivy? Um, I feel like Andrew is going to chew me out if I say too much because we have an entire episode dedicated to Ivy coming up very soon. So I'm going to plead the fifth for a moment. I guess what I'd say is that if you are the Knicks and if you feel that Ivy has true star potential and you feel like he will meet that star potential and you're looking at giving up one of next year's pick or quickly or Obi. I would understand giving up one of them. I wouldn't like it, but I would understand it because if we're talking about, Hey, the Knicks need to take a swing and look at star potential. That's where it starts. So I'll, I'll answer the rest of that question with the gentleman next week. Um, from Matt, Aussie Knicks fan. Love the show, Jeremy, and thank you. And thank you for the Super Chat contribution. Very appreciated. How likely is it, 50%, that Knicks move up to four? I am very excited about the idea of consolidating assets for the fourth pick. I'm just going to be dubious that they do it because it's tough. I'm not going to lie. It is, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible at all. It's certainly possible. If the Knicks want something, then they can get it. It's just they are better teams ahead of them. So better teams that are as in teams that are better positioned to get Jaden Ivy than if the Knicks had just done it. But if they're determined to get it, as I've said, I think it's either you're giving up a lot to move up from 11 to four, or you're giving up a little to get from 11 to seven. And then you're giving up a little to get seven to four. Is it comparable in terms of what you'd give up to get from 11 to four to 11 to seven and seven to four? Uh, it might be, I think it's actually, it'll cost less to jump twice, but uh, because at least you're appeasing, you have to you have to kind of please two other teams as opposed to just one. But the ask for the one would be so grand that I just don't think that's actually going to be an option. So I'll put it at um, I'll put it ten percent. I think ten percent feels fair. You know, like seven or eight 
again, I still think the Pelicans are a really great trade partner for the Knicks uh, for reasons that I'll probably discuss as well. I mean, we've talked about a little bit before. They're, it's mostly their salary situation. I'm still very curious about how that Devontae Graham contract is viewed, especially now that they have CJ McCollum and you factor in Zion moving forward, what that means for a team that does not pay the tax, which is going to be close to the tax. So it'll be interesting to see how they navigate, but I'll say 10%. Maybe it's maybe it's higher. Hopefully it is um, if they love him. But for now, we'll stick with 10. Steve Savale over under how many more all star teams will Julius be on? I say one and a half. I'm honestly surprised, Steve, that the line wasn't zero point five just because. I just it's not that Julius can't be a good player. He can be a good player. The question is, is he going to have a season that was completely different from every other season he's had again? I I don't know. I don't think so, especially when you consider the usage rate. I mean, he'd have to change who he is as a player in a lot of ways at essentially the age of 28. I think it's tough. I think it's really tough to do that. Um, like, are we? T- if we're talking about him, I, I don't know. Is he, is he embracing a Draymond type role. He doesn't have the defensive chops for it. He's got the playmaking when he's not in his own head and forcing things, but to get to that level, I mean, that's just a really tough thing to do. So you're either trading him to a team that can kind of try to wash away a lot of the bad things that he does, or um, they're putting him in a different role. I, I don't know. It's hard to to bring that player back. The genie's kind of out of the bottle. It's probably why Tibbs struggled to corral him. Even Berman seemed to say it, where Julius is a little bit more sensitive. So getting him to kind of play differently, if if someone's a bit more temperamental, how do they respond to change? It's tough. If you're leading something and then you're being told, oh, well, you're not a leader anymore. Do you accept it and do you move on? Do you just kind of drag your feet. I don't know. I'm I'm going to go with I hope I hope it's over for his own sake, whether he's on the Knicks or not, but um I'm gonna go with under one and a half. It's a great season. I just I don't see it replicating. But that's for him to decide in a lot of ways. <laughs> next we have from Mino F. Jeremy, if we strike out on Ivy and Brunson and Julius is back next year, would that be considered a poor off season? Yeah. I think it would. I do. And look, you're looking at Brun- at Brogdon potentially in that situation. I, one thing to add, which I should have mentioned before, I know that John and I discussed the idea of the front office and how Emmanuel quickly is viewed long-term. I still think that they view him as a starter long-term, but in the short term, it's very clear they don't think he's ready. If the Brogdon rumors are to be believed and that it's not just league personnel that believes they're, the Knicks are interested and there's actually a shred of interest, it would f- fall in line with the idea of this year they still don't see him as a starting point guard. So if you're dealing with Brogdon, because let's say he's the backup plan, and Randall, and then you've got RJ in the mix because now RJ is going to fight for opportunities, Yeah, Emmanuel Quickly is probably going to get opportunities because I don't see Brogdon being healthy for more than 60, 65 games. But then you also deal with Derrick Rose and Deuce McBride. So because are you going to have four point guards on the on the roster? I don't think so. I don't think you are. I think that would be a bit problematic. And we saw four point guards on the roster this year. The only reason I feel like it went kind of better was because we actually had quickly able to play, but then it wasn't because then Alec Burks became a point guard and he's not a point guard. So it didn't feel like it was great at all. So I don't, I don't think you can go into next season with four point guards. Um, You get away with three and maybe one on a two way deal, but yeah, it just would have to be a lot of roster shuffling. I think, I think with that lineup of, Brogdon and Randall and RJ and whoever at the five, and I don't even know who would be playing at the two. Let's say it's Grimes. Um, it, there's nothing sexy about that. I, it just feels like an old 
classic Knicks lineup where even if the Knicks don't trade anything of significant value for Brogdon, it just feels like, hey, we're going to be mediocre. And what does mediocre mean in this case? It means a low ceiling team with a higher floor that then gets the Knicks in essentially the same position that they were in before. I hope it's a little bit higher than that, but even still, then the argument there is, well, if it's higher than that, then the draft pick gets worse. And if the draft picks worse and you're just staying stagnant, what good was the season? And the bad vibes continue. And again, I, I don't want to say the entire season is predicated on vibes. It's not, but we also, as fans, like we, we enjoy this or we try to enjoy this. And a lot of times we don't necessarily enjoy it. I don't think I would enjoy watching that sort of team. And so just from a personal standpoint, I think the head says, yeah, you can do some things down the line with matching salary and I get it and works, but the heart says, I don't want to watch this crap. I don't want to see players fighting for usage and no one be able really to play off ball, except for maybe Quentin Grimes. If he's starting, it just would be, so uh yeah I'd, I'd say that's a bit of a failure but we'll see you know i think the other thing to consider is if you told me it's just those two things and ruling out maybe other moves the knicks might make maybe those are good moves and i say well i really don't like what they did with brogdon and having randall but they did some other things so uh, it doesn't balance out per se but it's at least better then maybe you know with all these moves especially with draft day i think this is the one thing to keep in mind with the draft no matter what happens, it's just a piece of the puzzle. Like we can analyze it, but we can't really analyze everything until after all the moves are made. And we can say, okay, I see the vision for why they did that in the first place. That makes sense. Great. Eddie Duray, fill in the blank, Jeremy. I'll be disappointed if the Knicks blank in this year's draft. Uh, trade for a veteran or trade out for a veteran. like. Brogdon, like any player. Um, I just think if you're using that pick for something that's not a long-term investment, a good long-term investment, then you're, this whole season was worthless because this is the reward for a bad season. So, you know, like as we've broken down in our recent cap or no cap, it'd be great if the Knicks could trade out and get a, a pick in next year's draft. The problem is that the value never, it doesn't really happen. And the value doesn't match up when it does happen. And we have one example of it happening, which just goes to show that the odds are so slim that I'd be shocked. Uh, I wouldn't be super upset if the Knicks traded down one or two spots, if they can't trade up or if they feel like the guy they love at 11 is still going to be there at 13. That's okay by me. But I don't want the Knicks to get too cute with it because the level of talent starts up high with the first pick and it drops pretty precipitously by pick five historically. And you can find a good player at 11. You can potentially find an all-star at 11. But um, and I do want to be clear. The one nice thing that gets lost in the weeds is if you get a player that turns into a solid, you know, two-way starter down the line, nothing elite but just like a very good solid um plug and play guy that's a, that's successful for the 11th pick you know I, like i know with obi for example there's still time for obi but like obi doesn't need to be great in order for the pick to be justifiable people might think eighth pick you got to be good you don't i mean his, you need to be a starter that's but also a lot of the eighth picks overall have been bench players not very good granted then a lot of the ninth picks overall have been all stars. So, but when you look at kind of the baseline average, if you can get a starter out of a pick from like six and later, um, you've actually done quite well for yourself in the draft. It's just obviously you want more than that. And hopefully, more than that can arrive. Um, next from Jeremy E. Thank you for the super chat contribution. More likely to be traded this offseason, Cam or Julius? I'm still going to say Julius. I do think that cam is on the block much like how i think almost everyone on the knicks is on the block um what's going to be so fast about cam similar with julius is if julius is dealt the salary that comes back if it's expiring then what you do with cam because he needs to get paid and you're not getting salary relief because of the cap holds and all that as i've talked about before but i still think julius is more likely to be traded based on the fact that 
I just fully believe this front office knows what Obi can do. I think Tibbs at this point knows what Obi can do, and they want to prioritize that. And if they're not going to play the two together, then you got to move one of them. And I really don't think they want to move Obi. And I don't. I think it'd be a loss on their part if they moved Obi because they can't move Julius. So I just think it's the end. I don't think Julius wants to be here anymore. I don't think the Knicks want him to be in an environment where he doesn't want to be here anymore and they move on. And Cam, if the right opportunity arises, great, but I think there's a much more pressing need with Julius, and as a result, they move him. And I, I a reason why I can't wait for 16 more days to just fly by, um, I want to be right about this. And I don't mean that from an ego standpoint. I just, I just, I would like the two sides to move on. I just would. I think it's the best thing. Uh, Zach Smith, Jeremy, say we don't re-sign Mitch and we don't use a draft pick on a center. Who would you say starts at center for the Knicks at the start of the season? So, again, I like the idea of targeting someone like Rashawn Holmes. He's more of a placeholder than a long-term option, but if you're giving up Fournier for him and maybe even get, I don't know if it is a draft day trade and it's not even the first round picks, maybe it's that Fournier for Holmes and Harkless and like the 37th pick in the draft. That's something you could then use 37 and 42 to move up to 31, 32, 30, you know, something like that. Maybe it's an option. Um, <laughs> Prez has been messaging me about Mo Bamba a lot because uh, he's very much in on the Mo Bamba agenda. I'll say this because I, for the, the center cap or no cap or the Mitchell Robinson cap or no cap, I was much more out on Bamba. I wouldn't say I've done a 180, but I'd say I've shifted more into, I would understand the move a lot more. I think his shot diet would have to change up a bit. You know, the Knicks wouldn't want him to be the type of center who's just launching threes, spotting up constantly. But to me, he's the only free agent who can be had at the mid-level exception or lower where it's like, can you get a guy who can play 28 minutes a game? You can with him. He played, I think 25 a game last time. Um, are the magic willing to let him walk? Does that have to be a sign and trade because you can sign and trade him into the mid-level exception. I think the fact that he is from New York seems silly and yet at the same time, I get it because if he wants to not be in Orlando and if there's a location he wants to be in, then like, I get why it would be the Knicks. I get why it would be a homecoming a hundred percent. There was an article that was uh, well-written that I read today. Um, and it was basically talking about Mo Bamba's strengths and kind of him growing into the role. I mean, he's a, he's a good rebounder. That's something that the Knicks really like. Uh, he doesn't have that touch around the rim that the Knicks seem to like that Mitch and Jericho have, but the wingspan, the, the defensive intensity that can be there. I've grown into it more. I'll just say that. And I think that it's nice though, because it's like this, you have two options, or at least theoretically you have two options. Number one, you can keep Mitchell Robinson. Number two, you could sign and trade Mitchell Robinson and you could get Mo Bamba. If you're telling me that the like you're better off doing the second one versus the first one, which is just keeping Mitch, why wouldn't you? Um, not to say Mitch is worse than Mobamba or whatever. It the point is purely from an asset play, I think it makes a lot more sense, or at least there's a really good argument for the second one versus just keeping Mitch. Um, and I just I'm still just part of me is really skeptical that the Knicks want Mitchell Robinson. I just, I can't shake that feeling. They, there have been multiple opportunities to prioritize them and they just haven't. And, you know, again, if the, we talked about with Brunson, how the Knicks don't have to go under the salary cap to get him. If the Knicks operate as an over the cap team, the only reason they wouldn't bring Mitch back is because they don't view him in the way that Mitch views himself and that he's not worth the price tag. Depends on what the price tag is, but you know, like if it's, more than four years and what I think it was like four years, 50 million guaranteed or something that, that we talked about in the pod with some money that was uh, non-guaranteed as well. Then I can't fault them for that. I, I, 
it 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 hurt as just like an emotional perspective. He's homegrown. It's great and blah blah blah. But I can't fault them. And I think that fans would very easily get on the Mobamba bandwagon if he came to New York because he's a New York guy. He's young. Uh, it, it'd be very easy for people to fall in love with that. So it's grown on me. That's that's what I'll say. Akiva Friedman, do you think Randall's value is lower than it was after his first season here? His first season, that's a great question. I'll say no, because before then, a lot of what we were hoping for was like, oh, can he ever be a good player? And now it's, we've seen him be a good player. Can he get back to that level? I don't think so. But, you know, like this is still someone who did have a second team all NBA season. There's you, you can break through the mold there. It's it's less theoretical than it was before. It may not be realistic, but we know in theory he can do it. I think that again, I know people generally might be upset at the contract or whatnot, but if you're a team that feels like it's a buy low opportunity and it's neutral value that you're giving up and he's not going anywhere because you have him for a few years, he doesn't have to deal with a big market, then I think it makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to say now he has better value because if teams are mostly also going to be operating above the salary cap, and I think that for the most part, based on how we're going to see these contracts shake out, he, most teams will be above the salary cap. I don't think they're losing sleep over it. If there were a lot of teams that were trying to get under the salary cap and work around it, then maybe. But I think that a lot can change between now and next year, the year after that. And I go back to 2025 a lot. That's the first year that teams are going to get significant cap release. I think that's probably the opportunity. Like right now, let's just let's deal with it for the next few years. And I also know that people think Randall will obviously opt into that amount in 2025. He may not. If the salary cap shoots up and he's looking for one more payday or at least the opportunity to cash in where it's declining that option and then gets more money on the back end for doing it. Other players have done that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I I get that. So I think his value is still higher now than it was the year after he was here when that was just a nightmare. Oh, my God. That was just awful times. Jason A. Hey, Jeremy. Are there any other slash better red paper clip free agents? Ooh. Um, that are attainable? I don't. That I don't know. So. You know, what I'm going to quickly look up is uh, so John Hollinger had his boards, which was um, basically the amount of, you know, free agent guards and, and what you can or not just guards, but just players in general and the amounts that they have. Um, some of those guys might be continuous soup like. Um, Bruce Brown, but then do the Knicks need a player like Bruce Brown? I don't think that they do um there aren't a ton of guys that's the thing this free agent class is so not good that it's really tough to find those types of players um it'd be great if there were more like you know um technically mo bamba could be um red paper clip turning him you know maybe there's a team down the line that wants a center that's good packaging him with another player that gets you a good starter uh, you know historically speaking mid-level exceptions don't pan out the way fans like to think that they do they're usually kind of just like meh um and i know it sounds crazy because you've got money at your disposal so why shouldn't it generate someone but teams also break up the middle level exception into players who are probably more depth pieces that don't really help them out. But even if you're looking at teams that are doing the full mid-level exception, or at least more than the, what was the equivalent of the tax mid-level, it doesn't usually pay off a ton. Um, I think usually it's like, how do we get the guys, with the larger salaries and then turn those into other pieces. So, you know, I mean, I'd say uh, Anthony Simons, but he's not going anywhere. At least I certainly don't think so. He's really good, and the Blazers recognize that, and they'd want something significant for him. Like maybe they're the only thing they're willing to do is Simons and the Aiton trade. Other than that, I just 
Um, not a lot of options. So I don't think there are a ton of red paperclip options out there, but um, they don't, they also don't have to be free agents. You know, they, they can be anyone. Like I, I think that I still stand by Hayward being a red paperclip option. If the Knicks are trading, trying to trade for a star, not this year, but next year. Um, but that depends. Like that's something kind of a sneak peek of another thought that we'll talk about next week. What happens if we go another full year, year and a half, two years where stars don't hit the market? What happens if the jazz hire Johnny Bryant and make good roster decisions around Donovan Mitchell that keep him happy? And he's not forcing his way out next year. And we're talking about 2024. Are you willing to wait until 2024 to make a deal? What happens is the Hayward contract it expires. So are you going to extend Gordon Hayward? No, not. So how does that initially help you? And I think that's the best counter to the Hayward. I don't know if it's a, I mean, it's kind of a pipe dream. It's not really, uh, but uh, like what his contract is useful for it's for next year. But if next year doesn't yield anyone, that's a bit of a problem. And you don't need a player like Hayward. Um, from Adam Gatson. Thank you for the super chat contribution. Has anyone told you that you and JD from Knicks fan TV are the two brightest minds in Knicks space? Appreciate your content. Top act, uh, Knicks off season acquisition. Well, first of all, thank you. It's very kind of you. Secondly, yes. Uh, JD's great. I, people have been nice enough to lump the two of us together and I am very appreciative of that. But, uh, for me, the top Knicks off season acquisition, um, man, If we're going by star potential, it's got to be Ivy. If we're going for raising the floor, which I still think is a really underrated thing that the Knicks need to do, it's Brunson. You know, like, I don't... I mean, yeah, could you say Zach Levine? Sure. I just don't think it's likely based on the fact that I think he'll either stay with the Bulls because of the most money, or he'll go to a situation that he feels he can win at. Uh, it's probably not Dallas based on base year compensation and other issues, but something along those lines, um, or it's going home to the Pacific Northwest and wanting to be closer to, I think he's, he's from Seattle area, wanting to be in Portland, but I guess the top quote unquote realistic option for me is Ivy followed by Brunson. I, I do want to say, I, I like Jaden Ivy. It's more that if I, I'm not at the point where I feel like the Knicks have to trade for him. Absolutely. I don't think there's any have tos that the Knicks do in terms of like one specific player. It's more looking at the landscape, reviewing it, going back to it. Is Ivy the type of guy who gets to the next level? Maybe if so. And if the market's dry, yeah, he's a great option. Um, so I'll go Ivy Brunson in that order. Mino F. Jeremy, I know we have a surplus of second round picks throughout the next few years. How and when do you expect those to be used? Well, I would say my strong preference is still to, if the Knicks do get Brunson, to use one of those seconds, but it doesn't even have to be the best second. That's what history tells us uh, to get Brunson uh, and to use it that way. I think that um, you could potentially use that Pistons pick is probably going to be. 35, depending on what they do this offseason. The Mavs pick, I'm still very curious about because if you take Brunson away and the Mavs, I, I, I still think the Mavs are stuck in a lot of ways. You know, like they need a center. Okay, they have $6 million essentially to spend. They're not getting Mitch with that. They're not going to get Bamba. They can't use it as a traded player exception, although they do have a traded player exception they could use on draft night and before free agency begins. So how are you going about and getting a better player? And I think that the Mavs are in for a regression type season, maybe not in the playoffs, but at least in the regular season where they kind of slot down some spots. They weren't that far away from being sixth or seventh. Um, if teams get better, if they get worse, you're looking at them dropping a bit. If they're dropping a bit, then the pick gets better. Are we talking about them having the 20th pick? And the Pistons having the 35th pick? And if the Knicks still have their pick, are they picking, I don't know, 15? What does 15 and 20 get you? Um, does it move you up to 12? Does 12 and 35 get you to 10? Like how, how much climbing up the boards can you do? 
I don't know. But that's kind of what I would use that pick for. Or you could do it in a similar way of if there's a Jakobitis out there that you really want and you just draft and stash that player. Or can you split the baby like the Knicks did with the 34th or the 32nd pick uh, last year, getting 34 and 36 and drafting Jakobitis and Deuce McBride. So maybe, um, but that I think that's ideally what it is. The I do think that yes, the Knicks don't need all of these second round picks. Four of them. I mean, having six picks in next year's draft sounds great. It's not impossible, but then you have to move them because you just don't have the roster spots. I mean, we're already talking about this year the Knicks having a logjam with too many veterans, and there's the uh, conversation that I don't think people really want to have, but exists, which is that the Knicks may have too many young players on the roster and that they could stand to consolidate some of them. So that's where I think you could then see the move, but yeah, too many seconds ship one out for Brunson. That's fine. You could always move up next year. Just have coverage, do whatever you need to do. Um, I I'd look to move them not right now. Fortunately they have time and they have until next year's draft, but to keep that in mind. And also if the Knicks do trade any of their veterans for positive value, are they getting any seconds next year? If they are, then they really, really have to consolidate as opposed to just really have to consolidate. But hopefully they're not selling so short on some of the veterans that all they're getting back is a second round pick. We know that they prioritize their veterans uh, highly, maybe too highly, but I don't necessarily think that's the case, but that'll be confirmed if they're, you know, if they're trading whatever like Burks, Noel, and Cam was at the deadline and didn't do, they wanted two firsts for that. Um, if they trade for a lot less than that, then they would have played themselves. Um, Darren Hood, hey Jeremy, what is the biggest need for the Knicks in the draft? That is a great question. It's also much better answered by Chris Persianen in draft class. Chris has done a phenomenal job with that. For me personally, what I will say as not studying these prospects nearly as well as Chris has. I would say the biggest need is probably just finding ceiling, like a high ceiling talent, but not one that's like, Hey, let's just forget about floor completely and ignore that whatsoever. But I think a lot of it might just be athleticism, uh, which sounds silly. Um, like, I don't, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, the Knicks seem to like it. One of the things that I, didn't actually get to mention, or at least I don't think I mentioned it, but and wish I had, is that the Knicks love this front office loves verticality. Um, Jericho Sims, one of the best verticals in the draft. Quentin Grimes and Deuce McBride, they were pretty good. Obi, we know he didn't do, he didn't have a vertical for the combine, but we know that he certainly has a great one, even quickly. Um, so uh, verticals, verticality is important to the Knicks. It's explosiveness, it's athleticism. I'd say Jaden Ivey has that. It's just a trait that seemed like uh, another player, um, Jalen Williams. He's another guy that posted a really great vertical. I would not be surprised in the slightest. The Knicks went after him. So uh, I guess that's, it seems silly that verticality is the thing, but as long as it comes with other traits that are important to the Knicks, like, pull-up shooting, uh, maybe, you know, speed. I think it's certainly important. And I should plug that this Thursday, Chris is doing a live stream himself. Uh, it's called Dream. Draft rules everything around me. I know, I know, copycat, am I right? But he's going to do some great, uh, he's going to do the same thing I'm doing, just with the draft. So that should be really exciting. Uh, I would imagine he'll probably do some other stuff in the week leading up to it, a busy week for him, and then he'll get to enjoy some of the off season. So that'll be nice. Uh, Mino F, Jeremy, on the topic of most desired off season acquisitions, do you think the Knicks bring back Theo Pinson? I don't. I think they had the opportunity to do it last year. They did not want to. They could have had him in a two way roster spot. They didn't want it. Well, now Theo has been in the league for four years. He is no longer eligible to be a two way player which means that he would have to take up one of the 15 roster spots. And I just don't think that he will be here for that. Love you, Theo. Success seems to follow him everywhere he goes, at least for, for this team. But I just don't think that the Knicks are going to be the destination for him next. I think that ship has 
has sailed and hopefully that uh, they can still have good vibes next year. Uh, Jessica Clarice Elsener, thank you for the super chat contribution, Jessica. Uh, the five part cap or no cap was phenomenal. I truly appreciate your thoughtful reply to my comments earlier. I haven't checked your second reply yet. Uh, what time frame do you expect good or uh, bad Brunson news? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your thoughts earlier in the comments. For time frame, I don't think it's going to take very long. As John said, Brunson's probably a day one free agency signing. Listen, if he wants to be on the Knicks, they're going to work out the details. I will say I think it's kind of interesting, which is a, you know, a nothing word, noteworthy. I'm speculating here, but the reason I'm speculating is because I think it's just kind of huh, interesting is that the Knicks have not announced that Rick Brunson is on their staff yet. It's been reported by uh, Ian Bagley of SNY. It has not been officially announced. And I wonder if that has anything to do with negotiation in any capacity. Um, Like, is it, can he not talk? Well, obviously he can because they're father and son, but I don't know if the rules change at any point because Rick Brunson is officially on the staff. If that is considered tampering in any way, I, I really don't know. I mean, obviously there are ways around tampering and teams and players back channel all the time. This would be an example of back channeling. I don't know if because Brunson is a free agent and his father is officially on the team, if that would have an impact. So maybe they're just waiting until later on, but granted when there was a lockout, I mean, if there was a, um, well, I don't know if that would make sense because, well, actually, I don't know. Like if I don't know the dynamics If like doc rivers and Austin rivers, if there were a lockout, if they could talk to each other, I mean, are they not going to talk to each other when their father and son? I'm not sure. But it just feels like if that was the sort of thing that the Knicks wanted to announce, that they would have done it already. And they haven't. So my ears are kind of perking up a little bit at that idea. Um, let's see if we have uh, anything else on the agenda. I know Andrew is doing a great job with the comment section. And I certainly appreciate him for doing that as I scroll through and talk about things off the top of my head. Um, so I'll, I'll plug another one in the meantime. Uh, from, you know, F, Jeremy, I feel like most of us assume Kemba and Noel are guaranteed to be moved this offseason, but is there a scenario where they're on the team next season? I think for Kemba, no. I think there's a 100% chance he's gone. Just especially if you're bringing in Ivy or Brunson or hell, even Brogdon. Noel, I'm curious about not because i think he'll be back but i think there's a greater chance than zero that he's here uh i think they want to prioritize sims and i don't think they feel that noel is a starting caliber player he he plugged in for mitch really nicely uh, and i think honestly there's again if you love mitchell robinson the best season that mitch had he wasn't even healthy for we have yet to see him be on a winning team, which is something I feel like it's kind of swept under the rug. It's like how I feel about Yusuf Nurkic where he's a good player, but he also has not like, he wasn't a part of their team when they were in the Western conference finals. They haven't really done much with him outside of that. At at what point do you say maybe there's something there? Is it coincidence? Maybe, but maybe there's more to read into that than that. Uh, so I'll say Noel, it's greater than 0% and Kemba, it's 0%. The question then is, where does he go? I still think another opportunity, you know, I mentioned Devonte Graham, the Pelicans. I'm very curious as to how they value Devonte Graham because he's got three years left of that contract. Kemba's got one year. Devonte Graham's not going to play a ton, especially if you've got CJ McCollum, you've got Jose Alvarado. What do you do? Like, I don't think Kemba is cooked generally. I think Kemba is no longer a starting caliber point guard. I think that's abundantly clear. But I do think there's a difference between completely unplayable, doesn't belong on an NBA roster. He's just there for because of his name versus like he can do some things in the right role. And the right role might be a backup role where he's kind of like a good veteran that takes the Devontae uh, Graham role when Graham can't do it. Do the Pelicans value 
the expiring contract and not having to pay an additional two years for Graham as worth moving down three spots and saving money. Maybe do the Knicks want Devontae Graham as a backup plan to the backup plan to the backup plan? Maybe, but I don't think they're really going to be interested in him. But maybe another team is like, can you do a three team deal where you're sending Graham for the Bledsoe contract? Hey, here's the Bledsoe contract coming back. Like maybe that works out. I, I don't know. But at least that's something to consider where if you're the Knicks, if you're trying to move up the draft boards a little bit, working with those teams and not having to involve Julius Randle, which I know is usually the player who's listed there. And for context, it wouldn't just be Kemba and Graham and um, Bledsoe. There'd have to be some more money from the Knicks point of view where they'd have to send out Noel and maybe the Pelicans might have to send out something minor salary wise, but something of that framework the gist of it zach smith the the knicks currently have the 11th and 42nd pick the knicks start the season with blank rookie players i'm going to say three rookie players but i'm cheating because i think hmm, no i'm gonna say two but i'm gonna say one of them is one of those picks or both those picks are used to be moving up and and or the 42nd pick is a two-way player. I don't think their 15-man roster has three players that are rookies. Two might be pushing it. I'll say two, but I'll use the caveat of the two-way. So shout out to the two-way roster spots. That absolutely helps the Knicks in many ways. And um, something to consider. Another thing as well that we should I should mention is with Sims, if he'll still be on a two-way contract. Because if he's not, then the Knicks could use a portion of the middle-level exception to sign him for three to four years. If he is still on the two-way, then he's actually not eligible to be on the playoff roster because two-way players cannot play in the playoffs. So um, if the Knicks are looking to be aspirational and get to the playoffs and want to trade Noel, to me, that they kind of have to bring Sims in from the two-way deal. I kind of expect that they do. Wouldn't shock me completely if they did not have him uh, on the roster spot, but I'd say it's like 80 to 20% chance that that he's on a big league contract next year. Another Mino F. Awesome. Thank you, Mino. Keep You guys have been so fantastic. I really appreciate all these questions. It's been a blast, so thank you. Uh, Jeremy, are you pro or anti Melo coming back to finish his career with the Knicks? Uh, <laughs> got an answer from Andrew texting me saying Mino's question will be last and you better answer it correctly in all caps. So, um, okay. I will say this. I'm pro Mello finishing his career. If the role is right, if the Knicks are trotting out a bunch of kids and a no veteran presence and, they traded Randall for, you know, some sort of guard and there's a glaring hole at the four. Yeah, I think the Knicks could benefit from it. I really do. I know that people want to just put him aside and not have to deal with it, but I think that there could be something to be gained there. If it's the Taj type of role, then even better. It's not really hurting you. Taj is mostly a breaking case of gla- break glass in case of emergency player. I don't know if Mello will be that type. You know I mean? Like, he was productive for LA. He was one of the few bright spots that was there. Granted, if you're relying on a 38 year old mellow to give you like 20 minutes a game, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's definitely possible. We just saw it. But at the same time, like there's a lot of mileage. He's an older player, but yeah, I mean, if you're telling me it's like quickly and Grimes and cam and Sims, I just don't see the front office rolling out a fifth young player with that. I think they're going to want someone who's going to command more attention, who's steadier, who's been around the block, who can pull up, who can draw the attention of the defense, the, the, the defense. I, I like that's a mellow type. That's that is mellow. Um, so I'm pro him coming back, but it's gotta be the right circumstances. And then I see that Andrew has posted one more. 
uh, from JG. Damn, I'm late. Just listened to you and Chris's pod about Jalen Brunson. Good stuff. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, it was a, a blast talking about Jalen Brunson with John. It was a blast talking about it with Chris. I'm glad we got a multitude of opinions that were going on there. So it, Brunson's just, he's such a hot topic. Like it's amazing to me how divided fans are. I get it. I understand the concerns, and yet at the same time, going through the the cap or no cap, my brain is like, I I don't get it. I, I, yeah, there are concerns, but the cost, who he is, it, like as long as you're developing him with Emmanuel quickly, and you can do that, then it just seems like you're adding to the equation, like. We don't like I, again. I don't want to keep harping on Derrick Rose because I do like Derrick Rose, and I I think if the situation were different, then I could see Rose staying here. But we don't talk about how Rose hurts Emmanuel Quickly's um, development. Far from it. We we talk about how it's helpful. Uh, I've seen comments about like, oh, you know, you need to keep Rose because look at how good that second unit was with Rose and Quickly and Burks and Obi and then Taj and. Yeah, but also three of those guys were above the age of 30. Uh, veterans can be helpful. They can. They just were so accustomed to mercenary vets who took time away and did not help the Knicks try to win games and make the players better around them that we just, generally speaking, I think equate veterans equals bad. And I don't think that's the case. I, I think there are good veterans out there. I think Jalen Brunson's a good veteran. So, uh, but even still, I'm, I'm glad John agrees with me. I'm, I respect Chris and his disagreement. Although if you listen to the pod, there was a consensus. I felt like I finally broke Chris and I got to him and that was the case. So, um, yeah. And speaking of Chris, uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. And the reason I speak of Chris is because I would, once again, I want to plug dream, uh, draft rules, everything around me. It'll be this Thursday, exactly one week before the NBA draft. Home stretch. We're in the home stretch. And then it'll all go by so quickly. And we'll just sit here being, oh my God, what just happened? What the hell just happened? And then we'll get to debate about, you know, it'll be a 48 hour span, maybe. And then we'll just keep debating for two to three months on things that are theoretical or hypothetical or projecting. And then we'll get some basketball. So I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I will be back as scheduled next Wednesday. At least that's likely the time unless something changes. So uh, looking forward to that. And then you'll hear from me, John, and Andrew this Monday about Ivy and some other draft-related content. So thank you again. Stay safe. Be well. Let's go next.